Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2017 Robert S. Gordon Lecture in Epidemiology. My name is David Murray. I'm the Associate Director for Prevention and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention, and I'm very pleased to represent Dr. Collins today and introduce our speaker. Before I do that, I wanted to let everyone know that um, there will be time for questions after the Gordon Lecture presentation, and we have microphones set up in the two aisles uh, for those who want to ask questions. I would also like to invite everyone to join me at a reception for our ODP early stage investigators and our Gordon Lecture uh, winner in the NIH library uh, after the presentation today, just across the hall on my left. The Robert S. Gordon Jr. Lecture is awarded each year to a scientist who has made major contributions for research training in the field of epidemiology or in the conduct of clinical trials. Uh, the Gordon Lecture Award recipient is selected based on the recommendation of the NIH Epidemiology and Clinical Trials Interest Group. This is the 23rd year that the Office of Disease Prevention has sponsored the Gordon Lecture Award. The list of prominent scientists who have previously received this award can be found on our office's website, prevention.nih.gov. The Gordon Lecture was established in tribute to Robert S. Gordon, Jr. for his dedication to the field of epidemiology and his distinguished service to NIH. Over the course of 30 years, Dr. Gordon served in numerous senior, senior leadership positions, including special assistant to the director and chief advisor for clinical practice and research. He was an early organizer of efforts to address the emerging problem of HIV and AIDS, and he became a key coordinator for AIDS research. For the first 10 years of his service to NIH, Dr. Gordon made important contributions to policy and management issues regarding epidemiology, clinical trials, and the health effects of environmental hazards. Uh, today's, uh, this year's winner and today's speaker is Dr. Mark Schiffman. Uh, he received his MD from the University of Pennsylvania and an MPH in epidemiology from the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. He's currently a senior investigator at the National Cancer Institute in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics. Dr. Schiffman joined NCI as a staff fellow in 1983 and in 1996 was appointed chief of the clinical genetics branch, um, sorry, of, uh, uh, appointed chief of the interdisciplinary study section of the environmental epidemiology branch. He joined the clinical genetics branch in October 2009 to study intensively why HPV is such a powerful carcinogenic exposure akin to an acquired genetic trait with high penetrance for a cancer phenotype. Dr. Schiffman's primary research interest is to clarify the natural history of human papillom papillomavirus uh, infection in relation to risk of cervical cancer and to apply the insights gained towards improving the screening for and management of women uh, at increased risk of cervical cancer. Dr. Schiffman's goal has been to mitigate the morbidity and mortality related to cervical cancer, which is a leading cause of malignancy among women worldwide. He's directed one of the premier HPV cervical cancer research programs in the world. He has employed an interdisciplinary research strategy, which has involved collaborations between experts in public health, clinical medicine, molecular biology, virology, genetics, vaccine development, all grounded in state-of-the-art epidemiologic principles and methods. His research has altered cervical cancer screening and prevention, both in the U.S. and abroad, particularly in the developing world. His work on the four-stage cervical cancer carcinogenesis model uh, <clears throat> was viewed by many as implausible when it was first proposed. And uh, unfortunately, that seems altogether too common with important scientific progress that people don't make uh, much of it at first or don't believe it. I'm reminded of the uh, presentation by Cox on his uh, survival ship model uh, years ago. But his model, uh, Dr. Shipman's model, has been bolstered by extensive uh, research data from multiple settings, is now widely accepted. The model is the basis for rethinking our approach to cervical cancer screening and treatment. Uh, and so I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Shipman, whose presentation today is not yet on the screen, uh, but it is the changing epidemiology of HPV and cervical cancer, uh, from etiology to validation to prevention methods to dissemination. Please join me in welcoming the 2017 Robert S. Gordon Jr. Lecture Award recipient, Dr. Mark Schiffman. Hello, this is a great thrill for me. Um, 
as a first year fellow, I think, I gave a talk in here and my legs were shaking and I was asked to talk on something. Um, and I remember just being incredibly fearful that an MD, MPH, uh, coming to the great NIH would have nothing to contribute here. And um, now I realize that I look out and there's friends all around and this is my home. So thank you very much. And that is my wife, by the way, who I <laughs> slipped in to the internet. So I figure at minimum this is wasting $30,000 in lost productivity and I actually actively encourage multitasking and uh, anything you want to do. So after a brief introduction, I want to give it my best. I was trying to think what is worth so much time from so many people. So I'm going to talk about the highlights of the three phases of cervical HPV epidemiology that I've explored and a few important lessons I've learned spending my entire working life at NIH. If anyone wants a scholarly talk, then please just look at the Lancet seminar we did in 2007, which is still true, showing that we didn't uh, make too many mistakes then, but uh, for a more up-to-date thing, we just put out a Nature Reviews disease primer, and uh, that's, that would give you more details. I went to med school to be an epidemiologist, not the other way around. Uh, Paul Stoley was my mentor at Penn. I had wanted to do epidemiology since I was an anthro major, and I wanted to do good. And I liked statistics, like most people didn't. So I uh, spent a year in West Africa studying schistosomiasis. I worked for APHA's Office of International Health. I went to the Public Health Service. Uh, Office of Public Health at Park Lawn, and then I applied to Johns Hopkins to do a PhD in international health and was turned down. I met with the dean, and he said, uh, you're a bossy guy. I can tell that you're a bossy guy, and that you have a lot of things you want to achieve. And um, right now, MDs control international health in most of, of the world. And I'm not letting you into my program. You'd be unhappy, which really resented that. And, uh, but I went to med school, ultimately, uh, wanting to be an epidemiologist the whole time, which was an odd way to address. I kept saying, what's the evidence for this? We're doing so many tests. What's the chance of uh, being a false positive? And other things that led to in different grades while I was in med school. So then I did an internship, and uh, I wanted a P an MPH, but everything had been shut down. All the preventive medicine things had been shut down uh, by the, that current administration. And, but there was the Public Health Service Epi training program. And that was my last hope of getting an MPH paid for. We were starting to have kids. And so these guys actually hired me. And uh, two of them are in the audience. And I thank them for that, because I don't know what I would have been. I had also applied to be a family doc and an ER doc at the same time, and this was the reason I'm here, and I've never left. So I've only known Dr. Gordon. Uh, I don't know how many other people actually knew Dr. Gordon at all. Is, how many people here knew? Have, I can't really tell, but... Um, he would lecture sometimes and then convene this epi training program. And I want to say that he taught me an important lesson in that sometimes he would fall asleep while we were lecturing, while we were giving our little talks. He seemed a little bit disengaged sometimes, and I attribute it to his age, which is younger. He died at 59, younger than I am now. And then I realized he never complained, never said anything, but he was dying of cancer. And when I found that out, it was like, damn, you know, this guy is really dedicated because he's, he knows he's dying and he's still coming to these, to hear these kids talk. And uh, I thank him for that lesson and for his dedication and uh, what he taught me. So 
I've studied one thing for 30 years, despite advice from senior investigators, that I should switch it out. I remember uh, I started with four things, then I decided to study HPV, because what I wanted to do was make impact. I consider myself a preventive medicine doctor and a scientist, but I want impact. So I have gotten variety through focus. And what that means is I've been doing exactly the same thing in the same place for 30 some years, 30, almost 35 years. But it's like a microscope. You focus down. First you look at the, the tissue. Then you do low mag and you see certain things. If you get high magnification, you start to see cellular features. If you go to electron microscopy, all of a sudden you're looking at viral structure. And if you do special stains, you get more insight. And what I found is as we've clicked down to a greater and greater understanding of cervical cancer and HPV, whole new vistas open up. It really is like different fields, different field, different field. And there's the richness of a continuing story that I'm tremendously interested in. And also the sense that each time we're rediscovering a level of detail that will, of course, I'll never get to the end of now, I know. Now that we're down to the individual isolate whole genome and there's a whole new world out there that's redefining a lot of what we thought we knew, I realize there's no end to it. And, um, but I remember what Seymour, uh, well, I think Dr. Jablon actually told me once, um, he was an, an investigator working late into his 70s or something in radiation. And I asked him, what keeps you going all these years that you're still working when you could retire? And he said, find, us, find something you're interested in, make it your own, be curious, and do it as if you don't even care if you're paid. And I found that, and I'm sticking with it until, um, until they carry me out. So I want to talk about the distinct phases of HPV epidemiology, which has changed around me as we've learned more and more. First, we were faced after uh, Zurhausen discovered uh, the connection with the natural history of HPV and cervical carcinogenesis. We did etiology. Then we used some of those biomarkers and started to make them into methods of prevention. And then we uh, entered the trying to actually get people to use those methods. And that's dissemination implementation. And all with the goal of global cervical cancer control, because my heart is in international health. So, etiology and natural history. I remember being so excited as we were learning this story that I didn't even know what city I was in. We'd be on a bus uh, at some meeting, and we'd be like, each year had some discovery that was making it more and more profoundly interesting. And the, team, the group of, that was swelling from five epidemiologists at the first meeting to now there's thousands of people that come to these meetings. We were so excited, we was like, where am I? What, who, you know, it's just like, we just learned this, we just learned that. What a wonderful thrill it's been to get a sense of a team that was exploring that together. But I, what I learned is that no one remembers who discovered what, even 10 years later. You can like attribute it to the first person who wrote it, but forget it. If you want fame, Dr. Framini will be remembered. I personally think he should be remembered as much for the thousands of things that he did through creating DCEG and creating that space for so many people without demanding to be attributed for any of them. So I'd, I'd wonder, actually, I have to ask him sometime what um, he considers his greater achievement, his scientific or his enabling achievements. But that's, that's I'm not going to like put who, who discovered what. Um, because it's been a, a team effort, as epidemiology all, all, always is. So my bias, though, is that we look for a signal in the midst of noise, and we specialize in error, misclassification, randomness, and we don't try to control things in a kind of experimental way. We're trying to see the signal come through in an inductive reasoning setting. So I first heard it from Dr. Lilienfeld, who was my mentor at uh, Hopkins. He was very crusty, and he was ill himself. 
but I remember him saying, epidemiology is a butcher shop, don't pretend you're using a scalpel. And he had a, a way of wanting to simplify, simplify and make sure the measurements were right. Rather than, um, and with big data coming, maybe that's not as true, but uh, it is true that carcinogenesis is so subtle that we have to minimize error. We have to minimize error or the signal will be lost in the complexity of what we're trying to study. And that's been um, the reason that I always say it comes back to the two by two table. Almost every measurement, even if it's biochemical, starts as a visual continuous measurement. So even if it's a machine telling you yes or no, it started as some kind of blot coming up as darker, lighter, whatever. But it's always a continuum. And then we chop it into categories. And eventually we chop it into yes, no, exposed, not exposed, some way prospectively or cross-sectionally or, or in some kind of case control fashion. But after Zerhausen found DNA from novel HPV and two cancers, which gave him the Nobel Prize in the early 1980s, I spent about five years just trying to measure HPV uh, in all its aspects, and it was really hard to get it right. So much so that Bob Hoover, when he was mentoring me towards tenure, had trouble finding a paper that was etiologic or in any way not just a methods paper, because all I was doing was trying to figure out how to measure without error. And I consider that as incredibly productive and maybe hard to imagine being able to get funded now, which worries me when we do a raise with you know, multiplexing a, a million individual tests on a strip and each one has its error structure that we're ignoring or pretending doesn't exist. Because I spent time with one thing, measuring HPV, how to measure it so that we could do valid analytic studies and setting up cohorts. And I made a lot of mistakes and I wasted a lot of money and I still survived, which is another thing that I hope people can still get a chance to do these days, is have your early studies flow. So I was looking at HPV and disease endpoints because I was trying to get both the columns and the rows right. And we, through this, discovered we were doing uh, also methodologic work, this is my friend Arthur Shatskin, and we were getting together and all we did was rediscover really something about the etiologic fraction of a causal pathway, an easy way to remember it, that the etiologic fraction of a disease that's caused by a pathway is equal to the sensitivity of that biomarker indicating that thing, which is A over A plus C, times a correction factor, one uh, minus one over the relative risk. And the thing that was interesting is it almost always starts with A. Somebody sees a disease and sees an exposure. It says maybe these are related. And then you can go and start looking at B, start doing comparisons. But often it's useful just to do a case series and see how many of the disease people have that marker because that's the upper bound of how important that factor is for causation. And we had A, because we were looking very poorly at it, as pretty low. HPV was not very commonly found. You needed a chunk of tissue and you had to do southern blot and whatever. But it kept rising as we got better and better methods. And then we kept finding new, new types. So if the etiologic fraction keeps rising as you reduce misclassification, you're on to something. It's exactly the opposite of the well-known thing that if you have random misclassification effects, it will drive you to the null. Same thing can be used to bootstrap upward. If you really are reducing random error and you're getting stronger and stronger associations, that's a clue that you're on the hunt to something that's big. I've always thought of that in terms of nutritional epi, that if we could measure lifetime nutritional patterns effectively, we would see small effects grow enormous, but it's really hard to measure time-dependent covariates and uh, variables uh, effectively with single measurements. So reducing misclassification became my obsession. First, reproducibility, because if, if you can't do it over and over again and get the same answer, or if different people do it and they get different answers, then you're in trouble. And then accuracy, uh, according to a reference standard. And 
to do this, I had to accept the role, which was not easy for me as an arrogant individual, which hopefully I'm less so now. Um, to be a perpetual novice, to have to go to people and say, how do you measure this? Or how do you do this lab thing? Or how do you do colposcopy? How do you do cytopathology? How do you do um, histopathology? And I had to continually admit ignorance and start over again. And I'm still doing that. I still was doing that with genomics. Um, and I'm still having to admit that in order to grow as a scientist, you have to be a perpetual fool fool, or at least the naive to, and admit that um, in order to grow. So I just asked, like, what's the cervix? What are we talking about? What is the cervix? I, I just try to keep asking simple questions. As Bob once said, he was taught, who's the cases? Who's the controls? Ask simple questions. Ask simple questions. The answers are going to be profound. So it turns out that the cervix is just not a tissue, the bottom third of the uterus, sticks out into the vagina, but it, and it's not even just a ring of susceptible tissue that's particularly prone to carcinogenesis when HPV infected. But it, as Nico Vincentson and I have been examining, it has a topology. It's, it's enormous compared to the virus. And so the vir viral clones are almost ignorant of each other. They are ignorant of each other unless they collide. And on the same cervix, you have an entire uh, two to three dimensional kind of thing where you can have an HPV, but an HPV normal, CIN1, CIN2, CIN3, different grades of severity of intraepithelial disease. And rather than being a point that can be typified, it's complex as can be, the cervix itself. So then at the same time, HPV, okay, it's a small eight. KB, uh, DNA, double-stranded uh, episomal virus, okay, not very many genes, only a couple genes. Turns out it's an incredible evolutionary story. With my friend Robbie Burke, we looked at the HPVs, which are currently over 200 known HPVs, and what we found in what was my favorite paper ever, which was rejected five times, uh, because of that, because I loved it, um, that there was a particular evolutionary clade in the alpha genus that has evolved for some reason to be carcinogenic as its, as its lifestyle, where all the different clades have different, some just evade and don't do anything, some make warts, which is a wart virus, papilloma means wart, but around HPV-16, and its related alpha-9 types, almost all are carcinogenic. And alpha-7, which is H HPV-18, counts for almost most of the others. And this is all evolutionarily tightly related. And for some reason, they, they evolved this style of an extremely vigorous E6, uh, two oncogenes, E6 and E7, that kill um, you know, kill. They interact with uh, RB and uh, P53, and um, they do a fantastic job of keeping the cell alive, just like the movie Aliens. They keep the epithelium alive so that the virus can grow, um, keep growing. So even if damaged or mutated, the, the epithelium lives, and it's a perfect setup for neoplasia. And uh, so we thought we were really at the end of things when we realized that there were these types that were so specifically evolved. We weren't even close to done, as it turns out. At the same time, I was trying to figure out how do people classify disease? So through some really great people, Bob Kerman and Diane Solomon here, who I still miss incredibly, she retired. I can't believe she retired. She took a library of knowledge of pathology away with her when she retired happily. She's happy retired. I can't believe it, because I still want her around. So. But there were all these classification systems, mild dysplasia, moderate dysplasia. Every, everybody had their own scale. And then Ralph Richard came up with cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, one third, two thirds, three, the CIN3, subsuming carcinoma in situ. All of these are bunk. You know, none of them really are anything more than biomarkers. In fact, the notion 
they've been basically people who invented them have said that they don't, no longer are true. But they've become time-honored pathology names, and therefore we don't realize they're just biomarkers. Even histopathology of precursor lesions, just a nominal biomarker that has something to do with prediction of risk of neoplasia. And Papa Nicolau had it right. All he did was one, two, three, four, five, chance of it being cancer. And that's what these really are, just chance of being cancer, but they were trying to do a diagnosis that was more precise, and it became made into a disease. So someone would say, I have CIN2. I have ASCUS cytology, uncertain cytology. And they would act as if they had been diagnosed, when in fact, uh, what we've learned is, well, there's no reason to go one-third, two-thirds, three-thirds. Why not force? You know, there, people um, wanted the histopathology certainty, and that's still prevalent in the way a lot of people think of, in terms of trial design. In fact, it's very hard to debunk that once it's made into disease. Um, we're used to the histopathologist telling us the anatomic or surgical pathologist telling us what it was. And in this case, it wasn't very accurate. In fact, um, as I'll say later, well, I'll say it now, CIN2 doesn't really exist. So these are categories that are just um, arbitrary in a continuum. So to get to what really is HPV and cervical carcinogenesis, you have one of the oncogenic HPVs, there's about a dozen, that can cause uh, cervical cancer, but that doesn't mean they have the same strength. 16 is much more uh, uh, carcinogenic than any others. Almost, we th there was an old rule, one-third, one-third, one-third. If you have a low-grade lesion, one-third are going to persist, one-third will go away, and one-third will progress. That just had to do with misclassification. They couldn't tell the different types apart. When you get it down to an HPV type level, what really happens is, of 100 HPV infections at time zero, they rapidly, within months, m most of them are gone, and then it slows down. But this curve is really steep, and then it levels off, and then slowly you start to see precancer, which here is defined as CIN3 in this study. And then it sits, something magical about the basement membrane says, can invade. That's, it's a powerful uh, contact inhibitor and in epithelium. And so it stays as precancer, looking like cancer but not invading. And then it circumferentially grows. And at some point, additional mutations that permit invasion are slowly accumulated or quickly if you're, someone's very unlucky. And there's invasion. But invasion takes place over decades. So most of the sojourn time, is spent as a precancer, which allows pap smear programs to work, because pap smears finally catch something severe enough to treat in a very slow process that lasts usually decades. Now, what we were finding was, as we increased the number of HPVs that we related to cervical cancer, it turned out that all the theories about the ones that, cervical cancers that didn't have HPV, no HPV, this, there were all kinds of theories and talks given about what they were. They had primary mutations in this or that, or they were somatic, this or that. And it was very interesting to watch those theories be strained as C shrunk and shrunk and shrunk, and A kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, until virtually we found that 95 plus percent of cervical cancers had HPV of one of these types. And in fact, that whole group didn't exist. So um, we have very few cervical cancers that don't have HPV of one of those types. And so we have a unique opportunity of a major cancer with almost a single necessary cause. And that's been really, really important. And uh, hopefully we'll have something to do eventually with uh, eradication or, com or control, at least, of cervical cancer. So the, each of these stages has a very characteristic age peak. Just like 
if you have warts on your feet, they used to happen when kids got into middle school and they had showers together, and then you get plantar warts, which is type 1, HPV 1. Or little kids who get digital warts on fingers, and that's you know, HPV 2 and 26. There's, there's characteristic timings. And for sexually transmitted HPV, that's a, there's a peak with onset of sexual activity that then declines in terms of incidence pretty much everywhere. Whereas then there's a second peak of those that don't lose it, and that's precancer. And then there's the eventual, the grow out, slow, that plateaus or drops or goes up, but is cancer itself. And there, these three peaks, if you really believe in them, lead the way with this model, that this is the real model of things that are undeniable, the real transition states to logical prevention. Primary prevention, just stop people from getting HPV and you'll prevent cancer. Or get rid of all the precancers and you'll get, you'll get rid of cancer. And if you believe those things, that has some pretty radical um, notions that we'll talk about later about how we should go about getting rid of cervical cancer as fast as possible. Okay, so that's the natural history in a, in a real rapid blur. So this is Sholem Wachholder, who is a dearly missed friend um, who died a couple years ago, but was our companion for 25 years in these explorations, and was teaching us how to translate uh, the very best and strongest associations into uh, clinical tests. And so um, it's only rarely that a biomarker is strong enough, or association is strong enough to merit considering it for anything clinical. But if use in medicine or public health is the goal, we see the lab usually, or the clinician, that person who discovers A, as the accelerator, and epidemiology invariably becomes very dour, and we're the steering wheel or even the brake saying, hold on, you know, this is not really strong enough to merit clinical use. But this is where epidemiology is the strongest. They, you have to come through us in order to talk about clinical utility. You need epidemiology. And most biomarkers fail as tests. So the default conclusion, if you really want to be grandiose, is that we are Gandalf on the bridge and chaos of too many tests right to consumer coming at us. And we're saying, you shall not pass. But that's only if you want to be grandiose and think that we really are that effective. But, um, but basically, things have to come through population translational science to prove themselves. On the other hand, say something really does prove itself, like HPV testing. There is fierce inertia, usually, against changing a familiar clinical reference standard. So when you're trying to supplant a reference standard like CIN23 for the FDA or for somebody else, and say that instead you have molecular measurements that are providing a test that's better than the reference standard, better even than the histologic standard, um, I say let whoever is without conflict of interest cast the first stone and what I mean by that is almost all committees exclude anyone who has worked with these tests from the committees. Uh, but clinicians and cytopathologists are considered physicians and therefore without conflict of interest, where in fact what we're basically saying is we need fewer gynecologists, we need less screening, we need uh, less annual exams, and of course the people most impacted is we need less cytopathology. And so I say, we, everyone has a point of view in, when big things are shifting. CIN2 is, a, is an example of an endpoint that just needs to go away as being thought of as something. And that makes people very angry because they've spent their life trying to distinguish what's CIN2, what's CIN3, how bad is something. And it turns out that it's virtually impossible to make those distinctions. So. A lot of what we've done is to question all biomarkers, including our own, and even if it's clinically established, make sure that they aren't thought of as disease. If someone has one of these, an abnormal pap smear is not disease, it's asymptomatic entirely. It's a predictor variable, and everything is a predictor variable. And the other thing that we're trying to change 
is we're trying to change the view of what makes a good test. It's been based in FDA clearance and every other venue as sensitivity, specificity, and derived um, variables such as uh, ROC curves, a area under the curve. But that may be yielding, and, and Sholem would say rightfully so, to does the test correctly assign what should happen to the person? In other words, a good test correctly assigns what the action should be. And that's switching from the columns of a two by two table to the rows and to issues of absolute risk and counting up absolute risk numbers. And also, it, because we can't, do, we can't afford uh, randomized clinical trials on everything, it's shifting to learning how to use big data because you need really big data to look at uh, a lot of these issues. So um, we're finding that we have to be very careful because we have to, when we're doing these kind of trials, which are prospective trials, realize there aren't cancer. We're not following the cancer. So CIN3 is not a perfect surrogate endpoint. And we actually called one type carcinogenic, and it's not. And it takes 10 years to get rid of a test. And once one company uses that test, every other company wants to also have that type in their test. And uh, my friend Phil and I have tried for years to get rid of the mistake I made at that IR committee by using CIN3 prospectively as a surrogate endpoint incorrectly. 66 is a type that causes CIN3 but not uh, invasive cancer. And yet it's in every uh, test kit and even the ones that are being planned now will have it. And hundreds of thousands of women being told they have a carcinogenic HPV, and they don't. What did this thing just came on? What does that mean? I don't know. OK. So we now have all these tests. We've been developing a, just an embarrassment of riches of tests. We have cytology. We have HPV testing. We have using them both. We have low resource settings, high resource settings. We actually divide it more finally than that. And the problem is it is so complicated that there's so many algorithms now and different people making algorithms that we can't uh, keep up. So we are moving towards a different kind of dissemination of vaccination and HPV screening policy and trying to wonder how far do we go as NIH scientists. We don't make get guidelines. Clinical groups make guidelines. We talk about risk. And so we've made the decision that we, we provide the risk estimates. Other groups provide the decision about what they mean, because they're often value judgments. So the, the principle that a lot of us, or most Katki a lot, have promulgated is equal management of equal risk. Doesn't matter what test you use, but a certain risk means a certain kind of what you should do as you get increasingly severely at risk for cancer, there's more that you should do. And we're putting out tables like this instead of algorithms that if your risk is really high, no matter how it got there, you do something like immediate colposcopy or even treatment, all the way down to discharge or whatever, depending on risk. And that involves massive risk matrices, risk calculations that we are undertaking with all, all the approved tests and all the combinations of approved tests and risk factors. And so we're moving from algorithms to apps. And young clinicians appear to be very comfortable with lookup apps. It's not a calculator. It's just an enormous risk matrix that they put into the electronic, electrical, electronic medical record or on a phone app can tell you, given this and this and this and this and this and this history and whatever, here's the recommended um, guideline. And then if you push a button, here's why, here's the risk. And then if you push another button, and here's the educational note. And that is very different than a, uh, the old way, which was you get this test result, here's what you do. But the test result sort of disappears, and the inside disappears and a simplified recommendation comes out, which was considered a loss of locus control for clinicians, but the young ones seem to be used to it because there's so much information now that 
they realize they, have, they can't carry it all around in their head. So we're just one voice at the table once we get to disseminating something like this. This is what I learned. We may think that we understand risk better than other people. We're just, we're just one voice. We need to do much better discussing risk, about the social aspects of risk tolerance, decisions about risk. And um, unless we do that, we'll be just scientific voices that are ignored. So we spend a lot of time trying to learn how to explain what we do better, but without crossing the line to pretending in any way that we're in charge of what the decisions are. One society may tolerate a certain trade-off between a few cancers and uh, efficiency, other, or, or can't afford to not, whereas um, in the United States, we're very risk intolerant, and uh, we may do a lot more uh, in terms of interventions. I wanted to finish with a, a sense of the future and then try to get interactive. I'm much more comfortable talking to people than I am talking at people. So uh, I welcome any, any discussion here or in the future uh, by email or whatever. Say we really, really wanted to get rid of cervical cancer. We weren't just saying we wanted to or discussing it, but we, it was absolutely imperative to us, each one of us, to get rid of it. There are faster ways than what we are doing. And I want to give credit to Doug. Doug Lowy is a humble and interested scientist. And I you know, really am incredibly grateful that I could call him my friend over the many, many years because he's in the HPV field. And I'm sure that he agrees that the real high impact is dropping incidence and mortality of cervical cancer, not just having the promise that we're about to do it, and advancing fundamental understanding of carcinogenesis. Those are, those are what we really want to do. And what we want to do is do them as fast as possible. And so instead of this model, where we prove that a vaccine works, which is currently a two-dose HPV prophylactic vaccine that he helped invent, and give it before sex starts, and then wait all those years for cancer to be invariably prevented, and then screen people, which is a very difficult um, several times every three years or whatever. There's an, a theory coming, HPV Faster, popularized by Xavier Bosch and Nature Reviews, in which we take faith in what Amy Kramer and Alan Hildesheim are doing right now, which is a trial of one dose vaccine. One dose of HPV vaccine lasts at least five to seven years, it appears. And if you can consider this epidemic of HPV acquisition as any kind of epidemic, and if you do campaign, and if you just give it to everybody, one jab. Now, I'm thinking back to all the time I've spent in Africa, to Ibadan, to places that I've sat and I couldn't even see across the street, where Julia and I were trying to walk across the street together and lost each other in the crowd. You know, if you really want to get go to a place, like I was just in Addis Ababa, and I was looking around and saying, programs are going to be really hard to institute here. We need campaigns, something where you go around, you do something once. And that we've been successful in very poor places doing that. So if we combine one dose vaccine and know that it'll last five to seven years at least, we don't know how long it'll last, and that's the big trial that we're doing now to make sure we're right, but while that is being confirmed, and that's Doug's vision to do that trial with Gates. If we, if we start planning for a screening of everybody that overlaps that HPV vaccination of the entire epidemic curve, we have something called HPV faster, which means you wipe out the first uh, peak the only people who don't get benefit are those who have active infection at that moment. Those people you pick up on an HPV screening test and you manage and treat them. If you can motivate donors, big donors, to get excited about the notion of doing something definitive about one of the worst cancers, one of the leading cancers in the world, the first leading cancer in women in lots of very poor places, 
it re might re-energize the donor community if they think they can actually take something out rather than just institute a program that has to last decades. And that's the vision. The vision is to now get screening tests and HPV vaccination together and then to start seriously taking a very, very common infection leading to a common cancer and eliminating it or at least controlling it severely. Um, and that's sort of the hope of what we're working on now. And that's Doug's vision, I believe. So it, in the end, it's all about people. I, I want to thank Dr. Framini, uh, who I spent most of my career working under, for creating DCG. I sincerely believe that it's spawned things that he's taken no credit for, but have been incredibly, uh, I mean, thousands and thousands of things that he's responsible for. Dr. Chanik is moving us in the direction of a whole uh, world of genetics. And I want to really thank Peggy and Mark Green in particular, because it turns out that everything comes together. Mark was the first one with Peggy to realize that when I was coming as an epidemiologist and talking about absolute risk or positive predictive value, that it's the same as penetrance. And when they were studying rare family uh, syndromic clinical genetics, that, that those were pointing out places in cascades, growth or growth control uh, pathways, which are really hard to find if you just go uh, if you just go and you just try to find them as candidate or you try to intuit them, they were pointing out entire pathways. Each family, each syndromic thing was now leading to an exomic kind of exploration of the whole spectrum of that uh, mutation, that, that critical point and what it, and what it does and, and how it's modified and how there's whole, there's people with lesser risk. It's the tip of the iceberg to discover critical points that lead to carcinogenesis. And we, I think we had a common vision that we wanted to study strong effects and we wanted to study things that had clinical impact. And their understanding my desire to move to the clinical genetics branch studying HPV took some site visits to, uh, and pleading to even convince people it made sense, but they saw it immediately. And I want to especially thank them for uh, enabling the second part of my career. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that presentation. We have microphones in the aisles. I uh, encourage you to step up and uh, ask questions. Uh, we're available here for a bit to, to try to answer them. Or challenges. I love, I like, we don't, sometimes I think we don't argue enough anymore because we're afraid of uh, uh, hurting each other's feelings. But in the grand British tradition, it's just good good science to, to argue about things. It's not personal, so please. Yeah, as someone who did a residency in pathology back in, in the 80s, we had to go through the, the uh, cytology, uh, pap smears and things, and it metamorphized into the Bethesda system. But I think what you're looking at isn't necessarily specific to the cervix. We have the same problem, as I learned further on, with thyroid cytology, whereas in particular, a follicular thyroid cancer is a very difficult entity to classify, which is also a need of perhaps the same type of treatment as you did here with the cervix and the Papa Nicolau. No? Yeah, the Bethesda system was a tremendous advance, but it was just on the way to recognizing that the real action was at the molecular level. And so the, even the Bethesda system eventually yields because it's a microscopic diagnosis of a molecular process, and the best way to look at a molecular process is molecularly. So I think more and more we just have to do the first thing, which is reproducibility. Get the best experts in the world who are absolutely certain they're the expert in their area and compare them. And when they disagree, they can't just say, well, you know, you know, whatever. But then there's, sorry. that disagreement spawns discussion about the reality of any category. 
I think if you look at the whole field of cytology or cytopathology, you'll find those type of controversies in many different organs. And so that might be a fruitful uh, uh, direction for individuals need, looking for this type of a really stroke. willing. You need humility and cooperation from your colleagues mm -hmm. and a sense of humor like Bob Kerman had about the whole process because people get pissed off and you know when you challenge experts from around the world. So you, ne you need those people who want the greater truth. And I've tried to get epidemiologists, to all of us, to have a day where we all do our modeling on one data set and prove that we don't know what we're doing. But uh, no one would ever agree with me to. Uh, well, yeah, but the, the, the place to look would be the follicular carcinoma of the thyroid, the cytology. I, you, I bet yeah. you you'd be interested in that. Thank you. Thank you. There are two, I think, multivalent vaccines available for HPV. So uh, are they good enough for preventing HPV into cancer? That's, that's the vision that Doug is carrying forward, which is um, the work of Amy Kramer and Alan Hildesheim, which is a very large randomized trial of the, of the uh, Gardasil 9 and uh, Cervix, if I'm allowed to say names, and then seeing do they in fact last five to seven years in their protection at one dose. And uh, that trial's ongoing now in co collaboration with the Gates Foundation. My guess is from our preliminary data, yes, absolutely, we're going to find they are good enough for the kind of strategy we talked about. Not for lifelong immunity, but plenty long enough to wipe out an epidemic of HPV and to reduce it to a less common or an uncommon infection. So you think you might not need further injection? You are saying only five to seven years of coverage. Hear, I'm sorry. You do not need lifetime durability. You might not even need 10 to 20 year durability if you're only going about trying to crush uh, cervical cancer. Now, we haven't talked about cancer in men. We haven't talked about a lot of other things. But for the purpose of getting rid of cervical cancer as soon as possible, I'm sure that we can do it with a campaign and about five to seven years of durability. So things what you learned from the cervical cancer, is it also true for HPV-induced oral cancer? Oral cancer is a whole other topic, and if Anil is here or someone else expert, I'll leave it to them. It's different, different, different epidemiology. We've learned a great deal about the differences, and it might be a, a, a different uh, story, so I'm not extending to that. Thank you. Other questions? I want to thank everyone for coming today. I encourage you to come over to the library. Uh, we're going to have a reception immediately after. Uh, you can say hello to uh, all of our speakers and uh, ask additional questions there. Thank you.